those companies that are sustainable are much more resilient during a crisis than those that are not sustainable. Well, welcome to the show, Leila. It's awesome to have you here, and I'm so excited to be able to spend the time exploring your view of the world at the moment and um, starting with your world view coming into your new role as CEO of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange only in late last year. You could never have imagined that your first year would unfold the way it has. What were the principles you wanted to champion into the business when you came into it and what has COVID-19 done to accelerate or actually detract from that? Hi Tom and thank you for having me. It's awesome to chat to you too. Um, the key principles, and in fact, I had this discussion with the board at our uh, strat session prior to my joining in September of last year. And um, I feel quite passionately that the exchange needs to be grounded in the economy in which it operates. And so principles of sustainable and inclusive growth are really important. And um, as you know, coming from a country with the dubious um, legacy of having uh, the highest inequality in the world or the highest Gini coefficient, um, I think that's, that's even more important than ever before. And so we are very much focused on how do we make this exchange, how do we make our capital markets more accessible to the broader public? How do we encourage savings? How do we build um, SME markets? And how do we build sustainable growth? And that naturally that has to be that has to play out through the culture in the organization. I'm really interested to know, you know, with COVID-19, have you actually seen opportunities to accelerate that narrative of inclusive growth? We've seen such a great response from so many businesses and obviously the, the government and public sector to support. Is, uh, is this almost a catalyst for that kind of transformation? There's no question. There's an enormous catalyst that has created a social consciousness um, at a level that I've not seen um, in, in my uh, sort of 20, 25 years of, of being in business. <clears throat> and um, I'd say probably uh, what I've done, what, what I've seen in the organization is that there are so many random acts of kindness. There is a genuine desire by all of our staff, by our customers and by ourselves to do much more on the social level. And there's, there's much more of an ownership mentality about the problems of the country around inequality, around the need to be more sustainable. And um, particularly that's culminating in a much better public private partnership between government and private sector. And um, we seem to be working together in a way that I haven't experienced in, in my past. Wow, that's great to hear. And, and you're in this fortunate position where you are leading an organization, you're seeing into what the markets are doing both locally and internationally, but you're also interfacing with so many of uh, the CEOs who are guiding other organizations towards this, this common good. Are you hearing that from all around you, that they're really seeing this as an opportunity to shift the narrative? I am hearing it largely. Um, I, I, I hear different perspectives and, and some perspectives are, are on the negative, more pessimistic side and others are, are more optimistic. But I think uniformly what I am hearing from others is that there is a, a greater willingness to step up and to what we call build back better and to genuinely make a contribution at a social level and also at a, a climate and environmental level. So, so there's definitely an increased awareness. There's an increased sensitivity and a higher level of consciousness, um, which is quite inspiring. And I think in some ways that is um, uh, the catalyst is, is visual images that we see um, in, in the media with, um, for example, penguins walking down, um, uh, down the road in Simonstown or pictures of uh, 
the Himalayas, which are completely visible from India, which was, was never the case before. And, and so these sort of very visual triggers are, are highlighting um, the importance and the, the genuine value that we can contribute in, for example, climate change. It's also highlighting a number of the fractures that we're seeing in society um, and fractures that have always been there. But um, those fault lines were, we were almost conditioned into accepting that way of life. And um, what the COVID crisis has done is it's created a catalyst um, for us to, to prioritize social responsibility and sustainability in a way that I, I don't think we would have had we not faced into a crisis of this nature. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And I think particularly the inequalities that have been highlighted, you know, even despite the fact that we're all, we're all uh, experiencing a common enemy and an invisible enemy as it, as it is, but um, you know, some are more ably equipped to deal with than others. And that's very apparent now. Um, and it's also, you know, th that inequality has been spawned by all sorts of other things like the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, yeah. And it seems like the world, as you said earlier, really is embracing and experiencing a shift in consciousness, um, which is, which is uh, daunting in one sense, and we hope it all goes the right way, um, yeah. but very liberating in another. And I'd love to pick up on, on a phrase that you used earlier, um, build back better. And I know that that phrase is, is part of the narrative of um, a United Nations uh, Alliance. I'd love you to tell me a little bit about it and your role in it and, um, and what you're seeing in terms of the impact that that organization or that alliance is having in helping to shift capital markets in support of this more sustainable future we're talking about. So the GISD uh, Alliance is, is an alliance uh, the, uh, which is for global investors for sustainable development. And it's by invitation only. It was created by the United Nations Secretary General Guterres. And he invited 30 of the most senior chief executives across the world. Um, and and it, it's really from uh, financial sector, from the manufacturing sector, um, so all of the large bank group CEOs and uh, asset managers are on this forum. And the idea with the forum is to use our convening power and our influence to literally build back better. And so we need to use not only the crisis, this uh, institution was set up and this group was set up prior to the crisis, but um, to really use our position in the market to improve sustainability and to achieve the 2030-17 SDG goals. Um, and and I, we had a, an extraordinary meeting and it was genuinely extraordinary in both senses of the word um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I was pretty blown away and pretty impressed by the seriousness with which the CEOs are taking uh, sustainable development. And um, I've seen this echoed through business sectors, through the largest asset manager, uh, BlackRock, um, who is very, very strongly supporting um, funding and investment into sustainable companies. And I think what it's highlighted is that those companies that are sustainable are much more resilient during a crisis than those that are not sustainable. And so it's a, it's a very exciting time to be part of a group. Um, I've been appointed as, the, as one of the co-chairs um, of the group. Um, and I come from an emerging market, which means that we can put the, um, the position and the agenda of both South Africa and of emerging markets on the map. And we've had a strong voice in the, in the forum. And I'm, I'm very humbled and I, I take it as a, a deep privilege and an obligation um, to serve the country um, uh, as, as a representative on this committee. So it's, it's a really exciting initiative. That's really wonderful to hear. And what I'm curious about is, is if you had a couple of examples to share of where there are these tangible changes in either capital flows. I know BlackRock has, has made some very public statements about their philosophy of investing and using uh, purpose as an engine room for growth and sustainability as an underpinning of their investment decisions. Are there some sort of practical examples that people watching 
could take and apply in their businesses and how does this ladder down from the biggest businesses in the world to let's say an SME or a mid-sized independent business here at home? So it's taken time, Tom, to um, build up enough uh, financial history to justify um, whether indeed these, the investment into sustainable companies uh, yields higher returns. And um, BlackRock have done some very interesting research and they're now at the point where they've got sufficient data to prove their initial hypothesis, which was sustainable companies are more resilient, especially in, in the face of a crisis. Their revenues are more, are more consistent and sustainable. Um, and um, they, uh, th uh, these companies return much higher yields. Um, there are various different studies, the MSCI and a couple of others which indicate that uh, more than 80% of the sustainable indices or sustainable companies yield higher returns than, um, than those non-sustainable companies. And um, so that's a pretty powerful impetus and pretty powerful driver for companies that are either borderline or not sustainable to start investing and making sure that they improve their level of sustainability. Insofar as the practical examples are that you that you uh, mentioned or, or requested, even uh, within our our environment, there are so many examples that I can share over the last uh, hundred days of of lockdown. Where first, firstly, we had a trade for solidarity day, which um, required that uh, or, or requested that all of our market participants. Um, contribute two days of uh, trading revenues uh, towards a socially responsible fund, which is designed to address those in distress um, as a result of COVID. We've also just recently um, launched and announced a sustainable development uh, bond um, or a social bond um, that was a, a week ago. And this enables companies to raise debt for um, social, socially responsible reasons. So it might be a COVID bond, or it might be a bond that's raised for education or for sanitation or access to water in rural areas. And, um, and so we're seeing more and more innovative products coming through. Um, I think that there are some interesting examples in the role that government can play in supporting a more sustainable environment. Some countries have looked at, for example, um, contemplating bailing out airlines in return for a commitment to a uh, carbon reduction or carbon footprint um, constraint in the future. Um, other governments are looking at potentially funding those smaller entities that will rebalance the inequity or inequality that we see between big business and small business. And so governments definitely have within their power right now the ability to direct fiscal stimulus and to direct flows to those uh, companies or those industries that are more sustainable or to direct it to the companies that are less sustainable with strings attached. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can use this platform that has, has been a giant lens on these awful and, and heartbreaking um, circumstances of inequality, of poverty, of joblessness, of people who don't have access to water, all of those social measures um, which the SDGs highlight um, are, are vital for us to, to make tangible in our everyday businesses. Brilliant. Uh, you mentioned earlier the fact that uh, businesses op obviously operate in an ecosystem. And I'd like to just unpack, you spoke about the role of government. What are the actual elements of a more inclusive, more sustainable and more equitable economic system, you know, apart from, from government stimulus, which we've sort of unpacked in some of the financial instruments? What are the conditions that actually help to foster this, this thinking? 
Well, I think you need a number of elements. Firstly, you need an awareness, um, which means you need the stats and you need facts. And so analysis into carbon emissions, into social inequality, into gender pay parity, et cetera, consistently updated to show trends are vital um, to, to create a catalyst for action. And then once you have that, those stats, and that, that awareness, you need a coalition of the willing. And effectively, that would be private sector and public sector stacking hands, working together to start to identify areas that need to be, that we need to focus on. In addition to that, I think you also need a, um, a either a, a stick or a carrot. And, and I've prefer more of an incentive and certainly the, the corporate flows, the, the capital flows that we are seeing, particularly from companies like BlackRock, are starting to favor sustainable companies. And so you need more incentive. And um, once one of the large players have, um, have uh, laid down the gauntlet and have made their intentions known, you typically tend to see other companies stepping in. And, and so I, I think that that global consciousness and that global awareness of, of the hard stats is, is really important. And then you also need courageous leaders who are prepared to lead the way and who are prepared to take that first step because it is an expensive exercise in the short term. It's in the long term probably um, very profitable if you take a, an absolute hard-nosed economic lens. But it's much more about what's the right thing to do than it is about necessarily only looking at things through, through a, an economic lens. So I think in summary, you need, you need a number of factors in, at play and you need a number of players. Uh, most importantly, you need a coalition of the will willing and um, you need consistent investment into sustainable initiatives. Yeah, I really resonate with that because in my own work, I've been seeing what I describe as four things. I think there's evidence that's needed, as you say. You know, there's, there's too few studies that demonstrate com uh, comprehensively that it's a more profitable long-term uh, way to go. And obviously it takes time and big sample sets to actually generate that evidence. So that's the first piece. I think tools is another one. So, so what do you align against? Are there certifications like the B Corp certification? that actually sort of embeds governance into the operations of, um, of an organization. Uh, the other one is community. Uh, naturally, you need to create some momentum around community because it, it stimulates the peer pressure and actually the, the aspiration to all go to this more promising destination together. And then the expertise, knowing that, you know, in some instances, the leaders don't have the toolkits to actually take the businesses on this journey. So what you're saying, really sort of reflects exactly what my picture is of of the situation but philosophically i believe that this has been a time where we've just seen this emergence of the will and when you said you know the the, the willing and courageous leaders i think that this has been an incredible time to expose the position of where people stand you know are you taking yourself on a on a journey of simply just recovery and keeping your head down or are you seeing this as a a potentially positive and optimistic catalyst for the kind of change we want to see and it's being highlighted you know so vividly in in the media over the past two or two or three months so that's really really great to hear inside your business and I know that you're mostly working remotely as as I can see in your beautiful garden as well but I think if I'm not mistaken your whole whole organization is almost remote at the moment how do you build culture and galvanize your team during this time the, with the fact that everyone is in remote locations? Well, Tom, it's, it's a very interesting point because uh, as, you, as you know, I, I joined in October of last year and um, I'd begun to, to work quite actively with my exco and my board to uh, really generate a strong corporate identity and a corporate culture. And when this happened and we realized that we were all going to have to be working from home, and I don't think anybody for a moment thought that it would be a multi-year situation. 
Um, we ironically took the opportunity to, to really engage with our staff and we put so many things in place, um, largely um, supported by our HR director who has done an absolutely phenomenal job, but equally so by the rest of the EXCO and, and our marketing and corporate uh, affairs head. Um, and so now we live in a world where we all do yoga together as a company, some of us in our pajamas, I'm sure, early morning. We have meditation sessions daily. We have um, uh, people coming in uh, providing thought leadership. I do very regular um, video updates, webcasts, email letters on what's on my heart, um, what is my ideology of the day given the the very extraordinary situation that we might be seeing, whether that's Black Lives Matter or um, massive uh, uh, climate crisis that is, is becoming so visible. And, um, and so ironically, the corporate culture and the corporate identity has never been stronger. And uh, I would never have expected that it would take distance to bring us together and, and make us work close, more closely. And um, that it would take uh, solitude and separation um, to create that unity. And um, so I'm, I'm very proud of, of the team and, and I'm very proud of the resilience and the endurance and the levels of motivation that I've seen by the team. Um, we, during March, processed historic values in the over 133 uh, years um, of our existence. We processed the highest number of deals, the highest value of deals, uh, the largest number of um, volatility triggers, and um, it, they were order of magnitude larger. <clears throat> and the fact that the team was able to remain resilient and to do that um, from the comfort of their home um, was for me uh, an enormous testament to the fact that things are working, that people are motivated, because when motivation levels dip, you tend to see errors, operational errors creeping in, failures happening, and we've just had none of that. And, um, and so I, I do think that's testament to the very rapid and strong culture um, and strong cohesion that we've, we've built, um, albeit uh, you know, through, through the lens of, uh, of our, uh, our iPads or, or our uh, computers. Yeah, communication is so, so important in times of crisis. And I think even particularly given the fact that we are remote. But what you've, you, what you've, you've explained to me really just sort of um, depicts the virtues, that I believe, of empathetic leadership. Yeah. It's really getting in touch with the, the value system of the organization and, and of the people in it. Yes. And helping to galvanize them around the beliefs of, of you know, what needs to be done but also the, the value that each of them brings to that team in, in the doing. You know, is, well, that a, is that a... Yeah, that's, that's such a valid point. And, and as you were talking, I was thinking about another factor that has actually shaped the culture of the organization. And, and that is the social responsibility that work that we've done. Um, so I mentioned the uh, Trade for Solidarity initiative. There are so many other initiatives that we've also supported, whether it's providing um, PPE to people who are in need. We were partnering with be a Business Leadership for South Africa, whether it is reducing fees for small and medium entities, whether it is coming out on the front foot and very taking a very public stance around sustainability, around inclusivity, around the role of the SME market. All of these things have demonstrated very tangibly to the staff that the reason that they get up and work every, go to work every day or go to their lounge to work every day is because we are, are making a contribution to the lives of people and that really matters. And I, I've seen a groundswell of, of, of sort of national pride and pride in the organization that has built up in, uh, under lockdown. And it's something that has made me very proud uh, because ultimately, um, People will never remember the profits that you made. People will never remember the new products that you delivered, but they will remember when you've 
genuinely reached out and uplifted a community and made a difference to somebody who was disadvantaged. And so empathetic leadership is, is so important um, and we are starting to see it become ingrained in our DNA, in how we interact with one another. As I said earlier, these just these little random acts of, of kindness and um, it's very uplifting and, and very heartwarming for me to, to see that in, in my everyday interaction with staff members and also with our market participants. Um, I've, I've been um, very humbled and, and quite blown away by the number of uh, messages that I've got gotten from le very powerful leaders in, in the community, just checking in to see how I'm doing and um, really just uplifting and mutually supporting one another. And um, these are, are, are acts that perhaps were not present before COVID uh, to the extent that they are today. Yeah, I was going to ask you a bit later what's inspiring you at the moment, but it sounds like you've answered me already. Um, yeah, I really think it is a time where humanity is coming to the fore and probably that time away from everyone where we were in sort of true lockdown uh, gave us enough time for self-reflection and, and re-evaluating the things that are important for us. And, and what we've done is come out on the other side with a slightly adjusted view on the world. Yeah, and, and that is definitely what is inspiring me at the moment. I think it's a, I think there are multi it's multidimensional and it's um, whether it's the way in which I interact with the lady who is sitting behind the till at uh, Woolies or Pick and Pay, whether it's the person that I see at the robot when I cross the intersection, whether it's somebody who just um, happens to be uh, passing me in the, in the street, there is a, a level of community that we, we, we haven't seen before. And um, what is, is also particularly prominent and, and is also inspiring me is that um, for the first time in, in certainly my lifetime, I've, I've witnessed South Africans genuinely being proud of their community and wanting to buy local, support local, support small business. Um, I spent three years in Australia and um, I've spent a lot of time overseas and it's always struck me how a number of other global countries have a deep sense of nationalism and uh, the, the fact that it's made their products are made locally is, is a, a very important marketing point and, and gen, engenders uh, enormous support. And um, for the first time, I'm starting to see that uh, uh, unfold in, in the South African community. And it's, it's heartwarming because it's essential to the recovery of particularly those who are, are worst hit, those small and medium enterprises. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm curious to know beyond Beyond that, what else do you think is needed to support this notion of business as a force for good? And, you know, that can be on a very macro scale of, of the biggest businesses in the country, but also the local grocer, the local restaurant. You know, how, how can businesses play a role and then how can consumers play a role in the choices they make and the actions they take? Mm. There's, a, there's a saying which was um, I heard from somebody much smarter than me, which is um, the cheapest form of fiscal stimulus is confidence. And, and so I, I think that business needs to play a role by taking a stance and being optimistic and being realistic, but on the positive side and encouraging growth. We need to, to, to inspire confidence on three different levels. We need to inspire business confidence so that businesses go out and start investing. The more investment you, the more you invest, the more people you employ, the more vendors or small medium enterprises you um, uh, involve to, to support that vision. Um, we need to inspire consumer confidence. Um, I, I walked through a shopping center and there were restaurants open and there was one one person sitting at a table at a restaurant. Now, I'm not advocating that everybody must rush out and, and put themselves in what they might perceive as potential harm. 
but we do have an obligation to go out and, and try and stimulate spending and try and get back to the normal way of living in, a, in the new normal. So wear your mask and be safe, socially distance, but don't completely retract from the economy. And then um, the third area of confidence is employee confidence. We need to build confidence in our employees in the future of the organization because when that confidence drops, productivity drops, uh, uh, absenteeism goes up and so our overall economy suffers and so there's a confluence of confidence that's required on all of those levels and ultimately it's the role of big business leaders together with small business and also of government to try and genuinely and energetically start to promote the positive um, the positive possibilities that um, the, this crisis um, has has uh, sort of created, um, and and that could be um, in the form of um, macroeconomic uh, transformation, policy transformation, stimulus that perhaps would not have been there um, were it not for COVID. Um, so there are businesses that are are in a difficult position. Um, the Economist magazine spoke um, just the most recently about the 90% economy. And what they're saying there is that 90% of the economy is bouncing back. It's only 10% which will genuinely struggle. And those, those sectors um, need to be supported ultimately when it's safe to do so. Um, but in the interim, we need to Keep, keep in mind that 90% of the economy will continue to function and therefore we should be confident, we should invest, we should go out and buy that um, uh, hairdryer or lawnmower or new couch or whatever it is. People are, are holding back right now and, and that's not good for, for economic uh, growth and development. Yeah, it's so important that we uh... We use positivity when I think so much of the news portrays uh, in negative economic outlook, regardless of what stimulus uh, happens. You know, there just seems to be a sort of a, a doomsday scenario at play. And the only way you can really change that is by telling a different story and, and actually working into that story. Yes. Uh, and what you're saying is it takes business leadership, but also just takes individual leadership in the decisions that we make on an individual household level. Um, and so it doesn't have to start right at the top with the biggest business or the government stimulus package. It can start at home, you know, with your family in, in the consumption um, decisions you're making and, and the investment decisions you're making. And I think that makes it very relatable. You know, it sort of brings it back down to earth for people. Yeah, absolutely. And words matter and narrative matters. And so what we are talking about around our family dinner table, uh, when we engage with our colleagues, um, the press play a, a vitally important role, as important as, as leaders. And, and so that balanced narrative is, is really crucial uh, if we are to, to, to grow our economy out of this crisis. Brilliant. I think, Leila, that's all we have time for today. I really want to thank you for sharing so generously. I think you've covered an enormous amount uh, in a very short amount of time that will... Uh, prompt us to rethink the decisions we're making uh, individually as well as in business. Uh, and I think there's a strong call to action that you're sharing here in that business leaders can reshape the narrative of the economy. And in doing so, we can actually bring about the type of businesses and the type of economic landscape that we all aspire to. So thank you very much for sharing so generously. It's thank you. One. Thank you so much, Tom. It's been absolutely uh, an absolute pleasure and lovely to chat. Uh,